Welcome everybody. Today we are talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. These patients, they are chronic visitors to the, to, to the ED. Their main risk factor is smoking actually. So patients with smoking whose age more than 35 presented with shortness of breath should be regarded as COPD until proved otherwise. Other risk factors apart from smoking might be industrial exposure, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, even uh, intravenous drug users can, can get this uh, problem. So the diagnosis should be considered in any patient with age more than 35 and smoking, and they may have exertional shortness of breath, chronic cough, which might be dry, but usually sputum production, which is regular sputum production, frequent winter bronchitis, and also wheeze. The presence of airflow obstruction should be confirmed by performing spirometry. Although spirometry is not available in emergency departments, but if available, if they do it, they may see that forced expiratory volume over forced expiratory volume in one second over forced vital capacity is 0.5. This is a normal patient. But in airflow obstruction, in, in uh, this patient is usually their level is less than 0.7. One of the diagnostic features that distinguish asthma from COPD is the degree of reversibility. Asthma is usually a reversible disease if you give bronchodilators, while COPD usually there is very little or no reversibility. So what is exacerbation? Patient is coming to the emergency department with exacerbation. They have an acute onset increase in the symptoms that is beyond normal day-to-day -day variation. There is no single defining symptom to say this is COPD. But if the patient have any change in breathlessness or cough or sputum production, so this is uh, defining the exacerbation. Uh, exacerbation might be due to, might be, might be following increases in the shortness of breath, in the purulence of the sputum, increase in the sputum volume in the cuff, uh, the patient might have upper respiratory tract symptoms, increase in the wheeze, chest tightness, decrease tolerance to the exercise, sometimes sometime fluid retention, leg edema, because there is left ventricular failure, right ventricular failure, so there will be leg edema, increase in the fatigue, and also acute confusion, usually due to increase in the CO2 level, so what happened, there will be narcolepsy. This is called CO2 narcosis. So patients present with confusion, mind you. Causes of an acute exacerbation, there are many causes, although up to 30% of cases, they don't have any identifiable cause, but mostly viral infection, bacterial infection, and environmental pollutants are commonly the cause. For assessing the severity of, a, uh, of an exhibition of COPD, the gold have grading for this system, system, have a grading system, which is mainly by forced expiratory volume in one second, more than 80% mild, between 50 to 80 moderate, uh, less than 50 severe, less than 30 very severe. But this is not important in the emergency department point of view. We have exacerbation of COPD diagnostic uh, criteria, which is also usually not used commonly in our emergency departments. This is very difficult and time consuming. But the NICE tells you that, NICE guideline tells you that you have to consider exacerbation as severe if the patient have marked shortness of breath, tachypnea, parasite lips, breathing, uh, breathing use of accessory muscles, acute confusion, cyanosis, and new onset peripheral edema, and also marked reductions in the level of, in the uh, activity of daily, daily living. The investigations for COPD, although the diagnosis is made clinically, but there are some investigations that might help you. Chest x-ray usually to find if there is any 
if there's any consolidation indicating pneumonia. Usually patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease have, have uh, what's called uh, increase in the lucency of their lung and also um, and also there is barrel chest, there is barrel chest and, and, and also some tubular heart. IBG, in the IBG you have to look for two main important things uh, which are oxygen and, and CO2. Oxygen usually low and CO2 usually high. So if this happen, it indicates type 2 respiratory failure. Type 2 respiratory failure happens usually in COPD, while in, in asthma, uh, there is usually type 1 respiratory failure. In type 1 respiratory failure, there is only increase in the PaO2, while PaCO2 is normal. Another important thing to look for the IBG uh, is also looking at the pH pH of the patient is if acidotic it indicates more severe disease. ECG to look for comorbidity, full blood count looking for white BC, renal function test and electrolyte is done, blood culture, sputum culture if the patient is feverish, theophylline level if the patient is on, uh, on theophylline or on aminophylline tabs. Emergency department management uh, of exacerbations, oxygen, Oxygen saturation should be, uh, and uh, so you have to to check SpO2 in percent, and also um, and also IBG, and look at them. Uh, if the oxygen saturation is very low, you have to start high flow oxygen. Then uh, after that, you have to maintain the oxygen saturation between 88 and 92. And why is this? Uh, many patients with COPD they are habituated to low oxygen level. Their usual oxygen level is this level. If you go at higher level, for example, become 99%, so their respiratory drive will give less drive to the respiratory muscles and they will get bradypnea or apnea. So there will be CO2 retention. So um, this is one. And... Uh, I have, to, I have to tell you something about what we use in emergency department is usually we use face mask. The simple face mask that's commonly used in emergency department provides about 40 to 60 percent of oxygen level. While if this ox face mask is having reservoir bag, it will provide about almost 100 percent of oxygenation to the patient. We have another type of mask called nasal cannula. The nasal cannula may be more suitable for COPD because it provides about 30% of oxygen saturation to the patient. So 30% uh, of oxygen concentration. So this is one. Second bronchodilator. Salbutamol in the dose of 5 mg and ipratropium bromide in the dose of 0.5 mg being given to patients. Corticosteroid, corticosteroid example, prednisolone 30 mg, and if not available, we give hydrocortisone 100 mg IV given to the patients. And then, uh, what about uh, other drugs? If the patient not responding th to these two, you may use aminophylline, theophylline group. Aminophylline given in a dose of 250 milligram over 20 minutes. This is if the patient not responding to nebulizers. Sometimes some people may, may use uh, bronco, uh, sometimes they use inhaled corticosteroid. For uh, inhaled corticosteroid, usually expose these patients to, um, to infection. It is not recommended by NICE guideline. So if this patient is not responding to these drugs and with the antibiotic you use it, then not responding, you may use non-invasive ventilation. One of the 
important things are CPAP or BiPAP usually, BiPAP bilevel. So CPAP or BiPAP give a high concentration oxygen with high pressure in order to open the alveoli that are closed. So it increases the surface area of breathing. Antibiotics should be used to treat exacerbation because most of them, especially those who have purulent sputum consolidation on chest X-ray, so most of them, their cause is due to bacterial infection. Best drug to use is azithromycin, but you also may, uh, you may use drugs that are used by local guidelines. Physiotherapy is very important, tapping the chest in order to clear the patient's sputum. And invasive ventilation, non-invasive ventilation, this should be um, decided by more senior doctors. Antitussives are not effective in these patients. Sometimes you may call RCU doctor, you may call anesthesia doctor in order to help you. They may use non-invasive ventilation, example CPAP or BiPAP. So if the patient is having respiratory acidosis and pH less than 7.35 and have CO2 increased, uh, then if the patient having severe symptoms, fatigue and also using accessory muscles, persistent hypoxemia despite supplemental oxygen therapy, then they use non-invasive ventilation. Sometimes despite non-invasive ventilation, the patient uh, is not responding or have some features, you may use invasive mechanical ventilation, example, endotracheal intubation. So if these patients are unable or not tolerate non-invasive ventilation, or they have cardiac arrest and post-cardiac arrest, you have to intubate them. If the patient have diminished conscious level, cannot uh, control uh, cannot control their airway, they have massive aspiration, persistent vomiting, uh, arrhythmia. Anyhow, these patients, if have life-threatening hypoxemia, you may intubate the patient. But usually, intubation for such patients is very difficult, and weaning or removing the endotracheal tube later is, is very difficult. So the key point is for this lecture is that any acute exacerbation of COPD uh, is sustained worsening of patient's symptoms from their usual state, which is beyond normal day-to-day -day variation and is an acute in onset. There is no single defining feature to say this is exacerbation, but changes in breathlessness, cough and sputum production are common. Again, the main treatment lines are oxygen to maintain oxygen between 88-92, inhaled bronchodilators, especially salbutamol, which is also called ventolin, ipratropium bromide, which is also called atrovent, steroid prednisolone or hydrocortisone, antibiotic if there are purulent sputum or consolidations on chest x-ray, uh, theophylline if the patient not responding to the above lines, you may also give antibiotic, as we said, Non-invasive ventilations and uh, RCU are also uh, one of the lines of management if all the lines are failed. Thank you.